We're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 13. Here's what it says, And now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. So, um, this passage is telling us really something that I think that probably all, all Christians know and then probably everybody in the world instinctively knows something about love being the greatest thing. They may not really know exactly what love is, but if you get right down to it, I think most people instinctively know that love is the, the most important thing in life. And, and when I say that, <clears throat> um, it's proven, and you know, that when people are facing imminent death, and they have, and they know, you know, my life's going to be over in a few minutes, or there's a very large possibility it's going to be over, that, that people <clears throat> reach out to people who they love. They don't check their 401k, they don't look at their bank account, they don't call the office and say, uh, is there, I just want to be sure everything's in order today. They don't check their grade point averages. Uh, when, when everything is kind of, you can see my time on earth is over, there's one thing that all humans have in common. I mean, the people, you know, General was here and, you know, unfortunately he's had to deal with a lot of death on the battlefield. But one thing is almost everybody, if they're unmarried, they're young men, they'll say, tell my, tell my parents that I love them. Tell my folks that I love them. If they're married, tell my wife that I love her. And in and, and that moment when they're reaching out, the very last thing that they're thinking about is they're reaching out to somebody that they love. For most of us, <clears throat> we, we remember, and I mean some of you are too young, but 9-11 but when the planes hit the Twin Towers and the USA was under attack and a lot of our, our, our people died that day and, and we had some communication you know, with people who were trapped in the, in the buildings and on the planes and all that, and I kind of Googled this. You could do it too. It's very interesting. But <clears throat> they weren't trying to find out about their bank account or about anything. They were trying to reach out in the last moments of their life to people that they love. And I, I just wrote down a couple of them, that these are actual people on that day that they, and, but there was actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. This young lady's name was Melissa, I'm not putting her last name in, but she was actually uh, <clears throat> first time in New York on business, and she was there that day. So she was just happened to be there, wrong place, wrong time. And she called her husband, Sean, and she said, I just wanted to let you know that I love you, and I'm stuck in this building in New York. There's lots of smoke, and I just wanted you to know that I love you always. So, I mean, she probably didn't know for sure that this is over, but faced with this tragedy and calamity, the first thing she was thinking about is she wanted to reach out to somebody that she loved. I wrote down one more flight attendant, and her name was Cece, and she happened to be on that United Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania and went down, and uh, she left this message for her husband. I, I believe that, <clears throat> if I'm re recalling the story right, he's a police officer, worked the night shift, and he was home, and he was asleep, and he didn't hear the phone ring when she called. And she left this message, so he heard the message later in the day. He, she left this message for her husband. Hi, baby. You have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane, and I want to tell you that I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. I'm so sorry, baby. I hope to see your, your face again. I love you. Bye. Now, this is just typical of literally <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of texts and, I mean, phone calls, messages that were left where people were trying to get in touch with their loved ones and friends because instinctively, when we're facing the end of life, we reach out to, to people that we love. Love becomes just what it says here, now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest thing that really matters and makes life important is love. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't live like that's the most important thing. And we don't, what I say, we don't love well. We don't love well. We realize this is, 
really, in essence, the most important thing about life. But as we go through life, we don't love well. So, so in this series, what, what I want us to do is I want us to learn to love well. Because it shouldn't just be at the end of your life that it dawns on you, this is the most important thing to me. It's people. It's my family. It's my friends. It's, it's people that love me and people that I love. It shouldn't just be that all of a sudden it dawns on you right at the end. It should be that we live with the consciousness of that and we learn to love well. So that's what we're looking at and that's what we're going to be talking about because I want to love well and I want you and you to be able to love well as you go through this life. And that's really the purpose of this series. So I'm going to give you three things as we kind of lay a foundation for this this morning. But the first thing is this, real love comes from God. Everybody say that out loud. Real love comes from God. Now, one reason, there are really a couple of pretty big reasons we don't understand love as a culture. It's very hard for us to grasp because the real love, or what I would call the God kind of love, it only comes from God. You can't get it from culture. You can't even get it from your family. Real love, it only comes from God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. The 20th century New Testament says, Love comes from God, and all who loved have derived their life from God and are learning to know Him. Now, it's interesting that the word love here, this is the Greek word agape, and it means unconditional love. Now, When we talk about the New Testament, I I, I know we have a lot of Bible school students here and so on and so forth. You know the New Testament was written in Greek. And we translated it, you know, out of Greek into English. But in Greek, they have four words for love. In English, we only have one word. So every time it came up to one of these four Greek words, they would translate it love because that's the only word we have in English to say. But in the Greek language, they have this this word that says, you know, now abides faith, hope, and love. This word is agape, and it means unconditional love. It's the God kind of love. The King James translators translated it charity in the King James because it's trying to show they don't deserve it. You're giving somebody something they don't deserve. They didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. It's charity. But it's really the word love, and it's really the Greek word agape or unconditional, undeserved unworked for, unearned, unmerited love. But then there are three other words that are love in the the Greek language, and they have the word phileo. And we use this, but we don't, we have to try to dress the word love up to make it fit. But the word phileo in the Greek means friendship or brotherly love. There's the city of Philadelphia, which is known as the city of what? brotherly love. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And it comes from this other Greek word, which means, you know, to be, to have friends, to be a real devoted friend, to have brotherly love with somebody. Then there's another kind of love in the Greek language, and it's the word storge. And it results from brotherly love. It's it's the love you might have for a child or a baby or or a real good friend. It results in, it's, it's, it's affection. It's hugs, it's kisses, it's holding hands, it's petting somebody. It's giving the Gucci goo to the baby and patting them and holding them and hugging them, and it's storge. And it results from, from, from deep friendship, from this phileo, and it's storge. Then there's another word in the Greek language that's eros, and it means sexual love. So when, when they came across any of these words, they, did, they just had to translate it in English, love, because that's all we have is one word for love. But there's actually four different meanings. And so in our language, that's why it's kind of hard for for us to communicate about love. So we have to kind of do some things to it to make it fit what we're trying to say. In other words, two grown men that have been real good friends wouldn't, you know, just say, hey, I just want you to know, you know, know, I'll see you at work tomorrow. Uh, You did a good job today at work. P.S. I love you. (laughs) They wouldn't do that. The closest we might get to something like that is love you, bro. We might say that, or love you, man. 
And that's the way men have to do it because we don't love them the way we love our wife. But there's different kinds of love. So we have to kind of, dr- and even in the workplace, you know, uh, some of you ladies and some of you men, I mean, you might end a text or a message and you might say, uh, you know, I did this, this, and this. Love you. And, but you wouldn't end it and, and say, I did this and this, period. I love you. You wouldn't do that. Why? Because you're not conveying that kind of love. You're talking about a brotherly kind of love. You're, I, I love you with this brotherly kind of love. So we have to kind of put this into a language to make it make sense because we instinctively know there's more than one kind of love. But the kind of love that's going to abide forever, the kind of love that is really has a supernatural element to it, is agape. And it's a supernatural love, and it only comes from God. Agape is from God. And, and the way the Bible describes this kind of love is is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the word agape. He demonstrates agape, unconditional, unmerited, unearned love. You didn't earn it, but Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. He died for you, and he, he demonstrated agape for you. Um... In fact, 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, I, I love this. It says, Beloved, if God so agape us or unconditionally loved us, we ought also to love or agape one another. Not just brotherly love. Not just be affectionate. He said we ought also to unconditionally love one another because God has unconditionally loved us. So there's this, there's this different kind of love. It's the, what I call the God kind of love. And it's a supernatural love, and it only comes from God. And <clears throat> what is so interesting is this is the kind of love, when you read through the New Testament, where Jesus said, you know, in John 13, he said, uh, I'm giving you a new commandment. That you love, he used the word agape. He didn't say have brotherly love. He said, I'm giving you a commandment that you agape, that you unconditionally love one another the same way that I've loved you. And then he said in verse 35, by this unconditional love, because it's the only kind that comes from God, by this unconditional love, everybody will know you're my disciple. Sinners can have brotherly love. Sinners can have sexual love. Sinners can be affectionate with other sinners. There's no doubt about that. But I guarantee you, unbelievers cannot have unconditional love. And that's why Jesus said, by this everybody's going to know you are a different breed of cat because you operate with a different kind of love that they can't even operate with. And it'll be the calling card that says, introduces the people to the fact that you are a believer, that you're a Christian. So he said, that's why he said, by this, everybody's going to know you're my disciple because you have this kind of love because this is the only kind of love that comes from God and then it can produce these other types can be, can be demonstrated. But this kind of love, unconditional love, is a love that comes from God. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. The second thing as we talk about love and loving well is believers have the God kind of love in our hearts. If you're a believer and you've accepted Christ, you know the Bible says God is love. Well, you've accepted God and he's came into your life. So the God kind of love actually is on the inside of you. It's in your heart. And that's what it says in 1 John 4, 7. Everyone that, that agapes is born of God and knoweth God. Everyone that has this kind of love. He says, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth or agapes, everyone that has unconditional love is born of God. So the people that are born of God, they're the only ones that can have this kind of love. That's why in the world you see brotherly love turn to hate. You see sexual love turn to hate. You see all kinds of affection that stops immediately and all of a sudden there's hate. Why? Because it's not this kind of love. But this kind of love is something that's on the inside of us as believers, and we have it on the inside of us. It's in our heart. Romans 5 5 says it this way, and I like this. It says, and hope makes not a shame because the love of God 
the agape, the unconditional love of God, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So when you receive Christ, you're actually born of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God moves on the inside of you and lives inside you, and you have this kind of love on the inside of you. Now, I wish it said that it was poured out in our flesh, but it didn't say that. It says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart, in our inward man. There's an inward man, Peter said, and there's an outward man. The outward man's your body. But there's an inward man that lives in that body. Someday the body will die. The inward man's leaving and going somewhere. If you're in the kingdom of God, it'll go to the kingdom of God. If you're in the kingdom of darkness, it'll go to the kingdom of darkness. But when you receive Christ, you have the love of God in the inward man, but it didn't get poured out in your flesh. You still have a body, and the love of God didn't get poured out on that. Your flesh is still nuts, and you still have to control it because it doesn't have the love of God in it. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, 18, he said, I know that in me, now this is the Apostle, he wrote <clears throat> book-wise two-thirds of the New Testament. He said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So you didn't get the love of God in your flesh. It came on the inside of you. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that's why he said this, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. So you got to do something about your body because the love of God didn't get poured out on your body and your body will continue to want to be self-centered and self-seeking and selfish and easily angered and resentful and unforgiving. And that's why, you know, I do a series on keeping the dog on the leash. And the flesh is that dog and you got to constantly keep it on, on the leash because it doesn't have the love of God poured out in it. And you're supposed to be allowing and growing in the fact that you let the love of God dominate you because that's the credentials that identify you as a Christian. By this, everybody's going to know you're my disciple because you have something they do not have. You have this supernatural love. You have agape, the God kind of love on the inside of you. So we all have to learn to, to dominate our flesh or it'll stay selfish and critical and proud and easily angered and envious if we don't control it and let the love of God that's in our spirits and our inward man begin to control our outward behavior. I mean, you heard about the husband and wife had gotten a big argument while they were driving down the road. In fact, they were going on a long trip and, and they got an argument about something and so they went for miles and miles and miles and they didn't say one word to each other. Just, just mad and didn't say one word. Finally, they were out in kind of the country and they passed the farm and there was a big mule standing over by the fence and the husband pointed over there and said, look, he said, one of your relatives. Is that one of your relatives? And she looked at him and said, yes, by marriage. <clears throat> hmm. But you've got to learn to let the love of God dominate you. You've got to let the love of God that as a believer, it's on the inside of you. But one thing about it is... Uh, you know, we all have it. You can't say you don't have the unconditional love in you because you do, but you have to learn to let that love dominate you. Which brings me to point three. Love can grow, or this unconditional love could grow, should grow, if you feed it on God's Word and you exercise it. See, you can grow in faith, but you have to feed your faith on God's Word. You can grow in love, but you've got to feed love on God's Word. And if you neglect to feed it, it don't grow. See, spiritual growth is not the same as physical growth. You're born into the world as a little bitty baby, and uh, you just automatically grow. I mean, you just grow. You just grow. Now, you do have to have food to grow, but you'll grow. If you get, if you get food, you'll just automatically grow. Well, spiritually speaking, you can stay a baby. You can grow physically, and you can be a Christian for 50 years and be grown, be a Christian for 50 years, but spiritually stay in the babyhood state of Christianity and just be a baby when it comes to walking in love because you haven't, you haven't fed love and you haven't exercised love. If you want love to grow, you've got to feed it. You've got to find scriptures on love and how the love of God's in you and listen to messages on love and meditate scriptures on love. And then as you feed that love that's in you, that love will begin to grow and it starts affecting your behavior and the way you act and it starts affecting the way you treat other people and the way you look at life and you become much less, much less 
self, selfish and self-seeking and, and pride and, and being easily angered and unforgiveness and all of these other things that are so common to the flesh, they begin to, to, to lose their hold on you and the love of God grows and begins to dominate your behavior. Love can grow. Galatians 5.22, notice what it says here. How do you know love grows? Because here's what it says in Galatians 5.22. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. You know, uh, it, says, it goes on to say humility and, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> self-control. It, it lists these fruit of the Spirit. But notice the first one that it lists is love. And it says it's the fruit of the Spirit, or one translation says the Spirit produces in human life fruit such as these. Well, fruit grows. It grows. Well, then you can grow in the fruit of love. In fact, you're going to need to grow in the fruit of love. And many of us, we know how important love is, but we haven't learned to love well. And I mean, I'll have to use myself and as an example. I know me better than I know anybody else. And even though I was born again when I was six and I was filled with the Spirit when I was 20 years old and, and I had an, a, a supernatural desire for God and for the Word of God. I mean, just God just put a special grace on me and I'd spend hours in the Word and, and in prayer and I'd, I, supernaturally, I mean, I had a grace to do that. But I had a very difficult time growing in love. And probably I'd have to say, if I look back over my life, one of the greatest regrets that I've ever had in life is I didn't learn to love well earlier. I, didn't, I, didn't, I was consumed with, you know, I, I wanted to, to accomplish God's will for my life, and, and I was consumed about that. I was very busy. I worked three jobs most of the time when my kids were little. I worked three. Most of the time one of them was volunteer but the other two, I mean, I worked 48 hours on another job, full-time job, and then I would work part-time. And, and I can look back and I can say, I wish I had loved better. I didn't love well because I was, I was consumed with trying to provide for my family and just trying to make ends meet and trying to do what I felt like I was supposed to do. And I, I could have been a better husband. I could have loved well, better, much. I could have been a better dad. So you, you, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to learn to love well now while you're young. Because in reality, it's the very most important thing. There's three things that abide, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest thing that you can do in your life is you can learn to love well right now. Learn to love well. Grow in this. And we all have to, we all have to learn to do that. You know... I remember, I mean, I, I had a short fuse and didn't control my emotions very well, didn't control my words very well. One time we were working on the, the house. We had a peering beam house, and, and we had a plumbing problem. My wife said the kitchen is all stopped up and it don't, you know, it's not working. I kept pouring Drano in it. I thought that would do it, you know, just get it done. It didn't work. So finally, back during the day, I, I, I saw my uncle take a, there was a, a can of, it was like pressurized air, and you could put it on there, and it would blow the clog out, and I thought, I'm just going to try that, so I got a big can of this pressurized air, you know, you could buy them back then, I don't even know if they do that anymore, and I mean, I put it in the sink, and I, I screwed down the other side where the, the uh, disposal all was, I mean, I cranked, there was a thing, I screwed it down where it couldn't come up through there, and made it time, and I blew that air down in that line and boom I mean just like that it was unclogged and I'm so proud of myself I just run the water baby well everything was going good I mean that drain, that drain ran better than it had ever ran since we lived there I mean just perfect and about two weeks I pull up from work one day and I pull up under the carport and I smell this god awful smell and I see stuff stuff running out from under my house and so I mean I got out of the car and I go look and and for two weeks now we have been uh, when I blew that I blew the pipe in two and we've been grinding up food and just dumping 
puke under the house for two weeks, ground up rotten food for two weeks under the house, puddled all up under the house, all up under there. I thought, oh my gosh. Now, I would have called a plumber. They would have charged me a million point five in order to do that. But I didn't have any money, so I had to take care of it myself. So I waited till I was on shift work. I waited till I got, I had a couple of days. I thought, man, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do this. So I got some tools together. And this was a pier and beam house, and it was low. I mean, it was low to the ground. There were some spots under them. They had nailed through the, you know, wood floor, nails sticking down all under that. And I'm pretty thick. And I mean, I had to just get right down low to get under there. So I knew after looking in there, this is going to be bad. So I had a job, and she had a job. Her job was to listen to me. Okay, that was her job. I might need a tool, and there was holes under the foundation, you know, on the side, so she could throw tools in so I didn't have to crawl through the puke back and forth to get my tool. I wanted to be close. Her only job was to listen. <laughs> Just listen. So I got what tools I thought I might need. I got a saw, I got some stuff, you know, try to get on. I get up under there, and the clog, the problem was it was somewhere else way down in the line, and it was a metal pipe, and it was all stopped up. Just horrible. So, so I get up under there. I see I don't have the right stuff to do it, so I'm hollering to her. Her job is to... Okay, so I'm hollering, and there's no response. I mean, there's just that much wood between me and her. I mean, no response. I'm hollering, hey, I need you. I wanted to get a sawzall. I wanted to get, I wanted to, I had some tools. I want you to throw it up under the house. I don't have to crawl so far through this puke. Because when I crawl through the stinking stuff, every few feet, I mean, I'm crawling. I'm doing like this. And I didn't want to add to what was already under there. So I, I, I mean, so I holler, and I, no response. So I have to crawl back through this, crawl out on the other side, and I come out there, and I beat on the door, holler outside. I couldn't get in. I mean, where have you been? Well, I just went to the other room for a moment. That's not your job. Your job. Let's go over this. Your job is to listen. If I need anything, I want you to do it. So, so I rehearsed her job again, because you have to be very detailed sometimes with the job description. So... I got a sawzall and, and an extension cord, and I said, now I'm going to take the sawzall under there. I got some other stuff, you know, and I'm going to crawl in there. But, but when I give you the word, you plug it in because I didn't want it being plugged in at the wrong time. I mean, this was wet and just meh. So I crawled through there, and I got under there, and I had happened to notice, man, I've got my cord all wet, my saw's wet, and I'm soaking wet with this stuff. And it dawned on me, might not be a good idea to plug that in. And so I hollered out there, her job is to listen, and I said, don't plug it in. But she didn't hear the word don't, and so she plugged it in. After I recovered <laughs> from a tremendous volt of electricity shooting through my body and me hollering, unplug it! Finally, she unplugged it, realized something was wrong. I later asked her about it after I cooled down. She said, well, I didn't want you dying under the house. How are you going to get out? How am I going to get you out of the house? Well, thank you for considering that. So I finally, it took me a few minutes to get my strength back. I mean, it shocked the snot out of me. And I mean, I was weak, and finally my strength came back. And one thing that helped my strength to come back was a force called anger. <laughs> and anger energized me, and so I am coming out of the house, baby. I am moving, I'm moving, moving puke. I am moving everything, and I am coming out of the house, and I want to have another conversation with my wife. <laughs> and I shoot through the deal coming out, and my next door neighbor, who's not a Christian, is standing there, but he had heard me hollering and then all this stuff, and... So he's standing there, and I come out with this look on my face like, Ugh! and he says, do you need some help? I wanted to say, yes, I'm going to strangle my wife, watch for the police. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I just kind of, and I knew you've got to control yourself. You've got to control yourself. 
So I kind of swallowed and controlled myself and did pretty good, and we finally got through all of that mess. But uh, it's been a process of having to learn to let the God kind of love dominate me. And I can guarantee you, you're in the process too. If you're really a believer, God's going to deal with you about this because this is our number one commandment. He said, a new commandment I give you. He didn't say, I'm giving you 15 things here you need to do. Disciples, write this down. Jesus said, I'm giving you one commandment. The New Testament says that if you keep this one commandment, you actually fulfill all of them. All of them are tied to this. Love. Agape. Unconditional love. It's not selfish. It's not prideful. It doesn't hold a grudge. It doesn't even take into account a wrong suffered. Well, there's not very many Christians that grow in that. There's people that have been Christians 20 or 30 years and they still get mad and hold a grudge and and they don't forgive and, and it's because we haven't learned to love well. But that's the mark of being a Christian. And we're supposed to grow in this and exercise it. And every time that you... Every time that you bite your tongue and you want to say something, every time you you control your emotions instead of having a fit and being mad and upset, you're growing in love. Every time you you keep your flesh under control, you're growing in love. And every time you feed it on, on the Word of God and you hear messages about love and you practice it in your life, guess what? You're growing in love. And the Bible tells us to grow. Fruit grows. And we need to learn to let this grow in our life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's interesting. In 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about, it's what we call the great love chapter, the the chapter that's on unconditional love. And then, you know, it wasn't written in chapter and verses. We added that to find stuff. It was just one scroll all written down. And so it goes to 1 Corinthians 14. It's really the same thing it was in 13. But it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest. That's really not a suggestion. I mean, Jesus said that that this is the commandment that I've given you, that you, you love one another. And it's going to be the calling card. It's going to be able to identify you that you're a believer in me because you have unconditional love. And then here, inspired by the Spirit, Paul says, what are you supposed to be seeking in life anyway? Well, I'm building a business. Well, good. I I mean, I want you to. But if you'll do this first, it impacts every other area of your life. As I I go through the series, I'm going to prove to you that if you do this, and you, and you seek love and you grow in, in the God kind of love, agape. Not just brotherly love, not just being affectionate, not just being nice to people, but this kind that only believers have. It affects everything. I'll show you scripture that proved to you this affects everything. It affects your finances. It affects your health. It'll affect your mind. It affects everything. That's why when you sum it all up, it says there's three things that are important, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest thing, if you want the greatest thing, it's love. And you need to pursue that and seek to acquire that and grow in that and make it your aim and make it your great quest. And so I've been on this quest. I'm not perfect at it. I can't stand up here and tell you I walk in the God kind of love perfectly with my wife. But I can tell you, I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I don't control my emotions perfectly, but I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I've made great strides in not being self-seeking and putting my own interests first. And great strides in learning to be patient. I've made great strides in it because I took the time to make this important in my life. I took the time to really make it my aim and my great quest, and I began to feed love. And I, I <clears throat> back, you know, it was many, many years ago, so we, we had a computer at work, and you could type on it, and it would print paper out for you. So I, I typed 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 in the Amplified Bible because that's where it describes love and says love is patient and kind and doesn't even take into account when somebody does you wrong. 
and I typed all of that out and I put, I put one in my pocket, I put one in my car, took one, put it by my bedside and I began to feed love because he told me to make it my aim and my great quest. And I just took him at his word and it began to change everything. It began to change everything. And it, it is an amazing way to live. You don't have to live angry. You don't have to have unforgiveness. You don't have to go around getting your feelings hurt all the time. You can live to where there's another love. It's not just brotherly love. It's not just being affectionate. It's, it's another kind of love. It's, it's agape. It's a God kind of love. And you can live to where this love dominates you. You can learn to love well. And if you'll do it, and then we're going to go through the series. And if, you, if you'll do this, I promise you it's going to make a huge impact on your life and your future. It changes everything. Learn to love well. It is important. You know instinctively how important it is to love people. You know. So let's learn to love well as we go through our life. Can I get an amen from you?